Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Fiber Broadband Association's Time for Breakfast. We're now in our 32nd episode of 2022. Before we kick off, I'd like to thank our sponsors of Fiber for Breakfast, including our gold sponsors, Graybar and Vetro. Um, and this morning, I've been in the middle of a massive uh, thunderstorm, and my power has gone out several times. So if I disappear, um, I'm sure that Chris and Jennifer will keep things rolling. Um, but last week, I was in Denver with NTI and the state broadband directors representing the 56 states and territories. And you know, it was a great event. I can tell you that NTI and the state broadband directors across the nation are excited and have amazing amount of energy. They know they have a huge job ahead of them, and they all know the significant positive impact their efforts are going to have on our nation for generations to come. You know, this is an FDR moment. And the atmosphere in, in Denver was electrifying. You know, back in Washington, there's a lot going on. I mentioned last week that RUS Reconnect has a new window of funding, the second one this year with the money from the Infrastructure Act. This round will have 1.1 billion in loans and grants, and the application window opens in September and closes in early November. You know, the FCC is going to soon launch its annual notice of inquiry, where it evaluates the broadband performance against the benchmark of 25 by 3 megabits per second. All right, the chairwoman, Rosen Worsell, has proposed upping the broadband definition to 100 by 20 and has proposed some uh, gigabit goals as well. The FCC will also continue to make ARDOF awards, which appears to be on about a twice a month basis as they approve long-form applications. We suspect that any long forms not approved by the end of this year will never get approved and hopefully Starlink stays on that never approved list. The FCC also plans to issue a Future of Universal Service Fund report as part of the Infrastructure Act, and it's going to discuss key items such as future distributions and funding for E-rate, telehealth, and the potential future USF contributions. You know, now we're less than two weeks away from our regional Fiber Connect event at Copper Mountain Resort in Colorado on August 23rd. Our registrations for Copper Mountain have surpassed our previous regional events. And so please register today because you're not going to want to miss it. And our last regional workshop for 2022 will be in Columbus, Ohio on November 3rd. Again, these regional events continue to gain tremendous momentum. So please don't wait to register as they will be sold out. So I'm really excited about today's Fire for Breakfast session because I love hearing from community stories and from Community, you know, hearing from community leaders who are making a significant positive impact. Today's session is an open access network in the Empire State with Mayor William Macy of the Village of Serboin and uh, let me see, I can say this, Shannon, Shenanoga, did I say it right, Bill? Shenanoga, probably didn't, County in New York. Before I formally introduce today's guests, I'd like to introduce Trish Ehlers, my team, who's going to walk us through some housekeeping items. Thanks, Gary, and good morning to everyone who's joined us today. Before I go over a few logistical items, I'd like to once again thank our Fiber for Breakfast sponsors, Gold Sponsors, Graybar and Vetro. If everyone would please keep in mind as we get going that you're all in listen mode only. To ask a question, simply type it into the question box located within your control panel. We'll host a Q&A session with our panelists at the end of today's webinar. This presentation is being recorded and will be available to members only on FBA's website within 24 hours. You can find the recording in the events tab under the Fiber for Breakfast drop-down option. At the conclusion of the presentation, you'll be prompted to complete a brief feedback survey. If you could take a minute to do so, we really appreciate your input. I'll pass it back to Gary now to introduce our panelists and get us started. Gary? Thanks, Trish. I'm Gary Bolton, the President and CEO of the Fiber Broadband Association. And last week at Fiber Progress, we discussed the limits of fixed wireless technology for rural communities with Dr. Andrew Afferbach from ECTC. This was a wildly popular Fiber for Breakfast session. And if you haven't read Andrew's white paper, I would highly recommend it. It's chock full of great information and a, a lot of details. And today we're going to shift our you know, gears a bit and focus on people and community broadband. In today's Fire for Breakfast, we're going to discuss an open access network in the Empire State with Mayor William Acey of the Village of Serburn in upstate New York. 
Uh, William, Bill Acey, had served as Sherburne's mayor since 2001. And from 1990 and onward, Bill has been involved in local government in Sherburne, New York. And from that time, he has placed emphasis on learning as much as possible at the village's municipal electric system. This spanned from the 1996 transition from regulated electric markets to the current uh, market model administered by the, North, uh, the New York independent system operator. Bill is a founding member of the New York Association of Public Power, association of 13 con consumer-owned electric utilities, which includes co-ops and municipalities or municipals. In 2017, Bill served uh, ex officio on the board of the American Public Power Association in Washington, D.C., and he's chaired their public or policymakers committee. So with all that, welcome Mayor AC. And for our audience, please type in your questions to go for our Q&A at the end. With that, let me turn it over to the mayor. Thanks, Gary. I uh, appreciate that uh, great introduction. Um, it's Shenango County, just for the record. And uh, I'm happy to be here this morning and share whatever I can can share with the folks uh, on the webinar today. Um, I, I know enough to be dangerous, so I, I tell people that all the time. Um, the electric background has certainly helped as we've moved forward into our uh, journey into the, the fiber uh, landscape. Um, we, we recognized early on that, uh, that broadband was gonna be an infrastructure that we felt we wanted to support. Many years ago, we built our own LAN and uh, we used it for our own internal use uh, and we deployed fiber in developing that LAN. Uh, we trained our electric linemen to be splicers, so we were able to, you know, provide the, the infrastructure that we needed to take care of actually to serve our water, sewer and electric uh, AMI system. So we were able to log in and, and manage our water system keep our sewer system online. Um, and at the same time, uh, looking forward to developing broadband for the whole community. So that's been kind of an ongoing theme here in the background. Um, the stars aligned during COVID and uh, we were prepared to do this uh, with, uh, and as you see on the screen, we hired consultants in 2007. We applied for grant money in 2009 to the American uh, Reinvestment and Recovery Act. We were, we were declined um, and we did not get the grant money. And uh, in 2018, our local uh, largest incumbent uh, filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy organization. And this was a catalyst that began our in-house design. So we started to design our system. In 2019, we felt interest rates were so low that uh, we were almost going to be able to finance at 0%. So we were planning to build over four years. And then of course, COVID happened. Uh, broadband became center stage and we had the design, but we hadn't put the financing in place. We had a lot of support for our financing, but we hadn't put it in place. Um, in 2020, we received the earmark from our local congresswoman, uh, which made us eligible for USDA funding. So now we're looking at two different pots of money that we thought we could use. And then in May 22, uh, we announced that the governor selected Sherburne to be a pilot project uh, for the Connect All program that she initiated. We were one of four municipalities to be awarded funds. And uh, as Sherburne is an electric distribution utility, uh, we hope to integrate you know, Smart Grid into our pilot project. And I think that was a, a strong feature in us being selected. Um, when you think about the broadband, it's, it's a lot more than internet for us, and it, it's a lot more than internet, I would say, for most other communities as well. Uh, Smart Grid is one of the things that's on our radar all the time, as uh, distributed energy resources become integrated into the electric grid. Uh, Real-time controls are going to be very important. Um, you're going to have to be able to turn power on, turn power off. You're going to have to monetize it. Uh, hopefully, you know, you'll be able to keep track of transactions. There's a lot that has to go on there. And one of the reasons we chose open access was because we can, you know, we didn't want to put that over the internet because you certainly don't want um, the internet to get hacked into and then lose your electricity as some folks in, in where you're sitting right now, you know what it feels like. So um, the smart grid concept and, and being over a, a, 
separate uh, channel made a lot of sense to us. Uh, you know, you don't want to have uh, transportation with unanimous vehicles. You didn't want to have that over the internet as well. So we thought the open access was going to be the, you know, the wave of the future. And that's why we went that route. It's one of the reasons we went that route. And I, and on the slide, it talks about other things, emergency communication, we, public safety, security. Uh, we're looking at, you know, probably a lot more cameras because, you know, trying to keep uh, police on the job and looking for police is becoming a problem. Uh, we're short of labor there, just like everyone else is short of labor. So that's something we look forward to in the future. Uh, I'll skip over that. Um, and I talked a little bit about, you know, the network, uh, is the network capable of virtualization? We got into the, you know, the whole idea of open access. Um, you know, instead of having a single strand uh, that's dedicated to one incumbent utility, I call them utilities, but uh, telecom, um, we felt that we were on the right track when we went to this virtualization of our single strands and being able to divide it up into its own separate uh, private network uh, with an automated open access platform. So that's that's another reason why we, we really drifted into this open access environment. Go to the next slide. Um, just a little bit about that. Um, it, it allows us to go into an active switch and engage our households and our businesses uh, and, and bring it back to a network operation with a strand of fiber that um, ideally will not degrade when it's loaded with uh, additional traffic. So we like the idea that it was going to be robust um, and that we could put many services over the same piece of fiber. Let's go to the next one. Cost, um, we're still you know, working on that. And I talk a little bit about our project. I mean, supply chain has been a challenge. We're still you know, chasing down uh, items that we need to finish our build out. We, we have most, well, I don't say most, we have much of our fiber hung. Um, we're still looking for certain electronic components. This is a challenging time to be buying product. That's, that's probably one of the things that keeps me up at night, you know, hoping that we can meet certain deadlines. Uh, originally, we were gonna do this over four years, then we crunched it down to two, and now we're trying to have it built by the end of the year. Some people want it built by October, but we're not sure we're going to make that deadline. Um, the monthly infrastructure expense, we estimated it to be 15 to 25. Monthly maintenance operation, 15 to 20. And then the ISP, uh, being it's a competitive model, gets us down to you know somewhere anywhere from zero to ten dollars. So we're looking at a 30 to 55 dollar uh, charge to our customers, and we hope to have one gig up and down. Um, with the potential to be able to go to 10 gig with uh, some electronic changes. That's kind of the overview. Um, you know, of course, we did have a problem with trying to attract investment. We've always wanted, you know, personally, one of the one of the drivers for me was that I wanted to see some investment in fiber here a long time ago. Uh, we're a rural area. We have about 2,000 customers. Um, we, re we really weren't going to attract any investment. Uh, so I think, you know, early on, it became apparent that it was going to be on us to try to do this if we were going to have any kind of competitive uh, internet available to our, to our customers. Um, we also had high rates. So that was the other thing that we tried to do. And for me personally, many years ago, when I was raising a young family, one of the things that frustrated me in a uh, negotiation with um, the cable companies for our franchise was that we had no control over the program. So there really wasn't true competition. There wasn't true interaction. And one of the things I liked about open access was it does give the customer true control over uh, what they choose and what they stream into their home. Um, you know, trying to, to find tele television programming that was safe for children back in the early 2000s, it was difficult. And uh, that was another driver for me personally. And right now I can't tell you, I get a call every day uh, for people that are, you know, getting five megabits per second. They, they, one person called the other day and said, you know, he paid a bill twice because he got knocked off his internet uh, in a rural area. Um, he was complaining, can't wait to get our service. Um, I think that most of the people in our community, because they've had good luck and good service with our electric system, want to be a participant in our fiber system. So, um, 
I think everybody's really embracing it here in, in the community, the people that I've talked with. Um, and it does also now become one of the first topics of conversation when it comes to economic development. I guess I, I will stop there and, and ask if, if folks have questions. Um, and maybe you have some, Gary, that you want to ask. Anything I didn't cover? Well, thanks, it's, Mayor. Uh, so how many, um, how many people are in Sherburne Village or how many subscribers? We, we, uh, we'll be around 2,200 to 2,000 customers, electric customers. And what's the, the density? So obviously in the village, you know, you're going to have good density, but or will you be able to serve outside the village to more um, sparsely populated areas? Or? Yes, we will go into the township, which will be you know, much more rural. And in some areas, you know, some of those folks only have DSL. So. And is that in phases or will you, when will have all, like if you're, you know, say that you're kind of, I'll call it hard to reach outside in the county, you know, when will you have fiber service versus someone in the village? You mean the timing of completion? I understand yeah. the question. Again, we, we're shooting for the end of the year, uh, realistically, um, probably closer to the beginning of uh, spring of 23. We're going to try to get as many people up as we can. Right now, we can't get certain things like clamps for our fiber, the clamp to the pole. Um, the guys are out putting it up now temporarily, and we're actually using you know rope connectors to try to put the fiber up. And then we want to come back when the supplies are available and then put the clamps back up. So, I mean, that's that's the game right now is just try to get it up as fast as we can. And then your model, so how did you come to open access. I mean, I, I get the whole smart grid, but you can do that without going open access. How, wh what made you decide to go to open access? And is your model uh, more like a Utopia Fiber or is it more like an Amen Idaho or? It's more like Amen Idaho. Uh, we got, we, we talked to Entry Point. Actually, we visited their, their system. Um, we like the automatic uh, feature where the consumer can actually change it themselves. They don't have to call anybody up. If they want to do it on their desktop, they can change it, change their ISP. Um, we felt that that created competition, uh, true competition um, among the internet service providers. And uh, we, we chose that model. The other thing that um, we, we tried to stay away from is any kind of vendor lock. So we're trying to avoid some of the software lock-ins that you might see with other systems. We felt that this was the easiest or the best one when it came to uh, keeping us as free to do what we wanted to do with our system and not locked into any long-term arrangement. So the village owns the fiber infrastructure? Correct. Right? And then you're taking, you're sharing that cost with your rate base. So is every, every citizen in the village then have to pay regardless of whether they take internet or not? Well, that's an interesting question because initially um, we would have had the capital cost that we would have had to charge to everyone. Uh, in the scenario that we're into now with the partnership of the power authority, almost or all of our capital costs will be covered. So we're really looking at O&M for the most part. So we're unique now because we received that funding from the government. Um, so there'll be O&M when people sign up and uh, then they'll have to choose their own ISP and pay for that themselves. So when they get, when the um, subscriber gets a bill, it will be all inclusive or is there just a uh, part that will go to the, the village and then a part that goes to the ISP? Well, uh, I'll be very candid. Uh, we're still in discussions about how that bill is going to look. Uh, ideally, right now, uh, the conventional wisdom is that we will have a company that will do the billing for us, and then they will return money to, to them, and then we will split out our portions, whatever portion that happens to be, and then remit that back to the village. Um, there will be capital costs that will come back in but we feel that this agency will be able to handle the phone calls, the billing questions, and uh, any kind of service questions as well. So we've kind of wrapped that into a vendor agreement, and then we're going to go out and procure a vendor to take care of all those things for us. 
And then how many ISPs do you think, well, I don't know how many arrangements you have already, but what in the fullest of time, how many ISPs do you think um, your subscribers will have a choice from? And I'm going to pull a number out of the air. Uh, right now, I think we're somewhere around two to four that have committed uh, and are interested to be on our system. Um, I hope by the end of it, we, we will be looking at at least 10. And how, how do those um, ISPs, how will they differentiate their service? So everybody's going to get a gig symmetric, what you're saying. And so what they'll be just on customer service and um, content or what, what is the differentiation? I Number one uh, differentiation will be price. So we're hoping to create competition. Um, service obviously is going to be a factor. And uh, if they can provide service, I think that that will, a good service, I think that'll be you know, a big differentiator. Price will probably be the big one. Um, but I also hear more and more every day about uh, cybersecurity. And I think that secure ISPs and secure networks are gonna be important. Um, hasn't it has been important in some cases, but it hasn't come to the forefront like I think it will in the future. So I'm going to say those that offer those type of ancillary services are also going to be a differentiator. Um, what about the schools, libraries, and anchor institutions? What does that look like on your network? Well, in our situation, we're going to be able to offer a LAN. Uh, so that the school would have a local network that they could actually not have to go out to the internet and come back, but actually work off our system. We can work directly with, with them. Um, and then they will have a direct LAN on our system because we can separate their, uh, their signal from the rest of the signals. So we've talked with them about that. Uh, that'll be good for those that are on our, on our system. But we have, I think, seven townships in our school system. So there's others that will not be participating in Sherburn's uh, fiber. So that's another issue for the school to work out, but those who are local in Sherburn Town and Sherburn Village will be able to have their own land. And what technologies are you using for virtualization and, and also for your subscriber connections? Good question. Um, I would refer that up to uh, entry point, but entry point is uh, working with us in the background. They will offer the software. Um, I know the name, but I can't recall it. So I apologize on that, but I can get back to you on the name of the software. Yeah, there, I mean, there'll be a, there's a bunch of questions here, so you can follow up in the email. We'll have all those for you. Um, what about, I got another question here. How do you manage users um, when they want to change ISPs? What is the complexity around that? Is that just simply a menu and how, how does that work? There'll be a menu on a dashboard and then the customer will be able to make the change. And then that information will be funneled back to our billing uh, agent and then that person will uh, redirect the bill to the customer. All right, and then um, did you consider any other models other than open access? Yeah, yeah, we did. I mean, actually uh, we looked at the GPON uh, and it's kind of evolved for us. Uh, we actually looked at dark fiber um, because we thought that was the way to go for the longest time. Um, then we look at even manual open access and then uh, we chose the automatic open access. So we've kind of looked at it all. We've been we're keeping an eye on it, you know, all this time as we developed our, uh, our plan. And, uh, and then the stars kind of aligned here recently when COVID came and it was a time that broadband again came to the forefront. Uh, we felt that open access, automatic open access was a way for us to go. And uh, that's how that's that's how it evolved. And then I have, here's a question here about, you know, now you're getting all this fiber infrastructure. Uh, how do you plan to leverage that for wireless, such as small cells or microcells and things like that? Well, we haven't crossed that bridge yet, but we do see that that, in my opinion, um, is going to be an option that is going to be offered uh, very soon. Uh, once the fiber is up, I think that there will be many things that we'll be able to offer that we can piggyback off the infrastructure. And that definitely will be one of them. We have no plans in the works yet, but we see that as a, as a definite possibility. And there are a lot of questions about EV. Um, so how will this be in, integrated for the transportation infrastructure? So for 
electric vehicles, uh, buses, things like that. What is that your vision there? Well, um, we're a little concerned about buses because of charging and having the infrastructure in place with regards to transformers. Uh, we think that might be, uh, we might be kicking that can down the road. Um, but as far as automobiles go, and I think the EVs, this will help us turn power on and off and be able to cycle and be able to control the charging rates of different vehicles in different homes. Uh, we should, with a robust um, fiber connection and the virtualization, we should be able to control that device, the car, um, and its charging cycles, as opposed to controlling just the meter. So we're looking forward to having that in place as well as time goes on to be able to control the charging rates of cars. And that'll help us uh, keep our system from being over. Oh. What about the environmental impact of the current technology used to produce electric uh, vehicles? I guess I don't understand that question. Say yeah, that again. I'm sorry, there's, there's evidently there's some advocacy stuff going on here. So let me, um, sorry, that one slipped in. Um, all right, so you're, you're a power guy now. I guess you've become a power guy. Um, how does this all fit into your whole smart grid modernization plans? Well, from my perspective, I've always thought that the, the least expensive kilowatt hour is the one you save. So I think that managing a system uh, from an energy efficiency standpoint makes a lot of sense for us. I think that we're going to be able to leverage the fiber um, in a smart grid manner uh, from the standpoint. We have a lot of electric heat. So I think that cycling on electric heat on and off being able to control load, uh, peak load, peak demand. Um, there's a lot of household devices that you know, all come on at the same time that don't have to. Uh, we can incentivize that with rate structure. And I think that that's, from my perspective, I think that's the future. And I think that we need to, you know, really kind of ring out of the, kind of ring out of the, the system every kilowatt hour that we can and become more efficient. And I think the way to do that is with a robust uh, communication system. And I think that we're already talking about different things. One is hot water heaters. You know, we've done that for years, but to be able to make our system a little more robust, turning a hot water heater off and on, um, the reverse charging of a car, I didn't bring that up, but you know, there, there, we may be able to feed the system a little better. And if we can aggregate, you know, different devices, and put that power back on the grid. Um, there's money to be made in returning that power back to the New York ISO and, and letting them pay us for it. Well, listen, uh, Mayor, one last question. And I think you talked about this a little bit, but uh, are you going to operate the layer two network um, yourself? Or are you farming out to the, the third party that's gonna manage and provision everything? Um, well, the provisioning will be done automatically with the software. Um, so I guess we'd be farming it out. I, you know, we're hoping that the provisioning will all be done automatically through the software, um, but we will have a third party that will be doing the billing and the customer service. So we will be farming most of that out. Well, Mayor, um, I really appreciate everything you're doing for the, um, your community. That's uh, amazing. It looks, uh, it looks like that you had um, since 1992, you've been working on this to get the idea and the vision, and I'm glad to see that it's coming to fruition. Uh, so we appreciate that, and, and not only for what you're doing for the village of Serburn, but you know, setting a great example for the rest of the nation. And thanks everyone for joining us today. I want to look forward to getting back together next Wednesday. We're going to be discussing connecting all how little digital literacy is critical for mental health. Uh, with Dr. John Torres, uh, medical doctor and MBI, and Noi Elons uh, from the Division of Digital Psychiatry at Bethel Israel Acones Medical Center. They discuss how broadband is going to be leveraged to improve mental health. So we'll see you guys next Wednesday. And thanks again, Mayor. Um, congratulations. And uh, we'll you. see everybody in a week. Thank you.